Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Routine Podcast. Gymnastics Conversations. I'm Chelsea. And I'm Chelsea's mom, Diana. And we're back for episode 39. 39. 39. Oh, good job. 39. <laughs> I thought you were going to try and speak in French. 39. Let us know if that's correct, guys. <laughs> Please don't let us know if that's correct. <laughs> we know that that's not correct. You tried. A for effort. It might be, right? Let's just look here. Uh-oh. 39. I got you. Okay. 39. You were close. 39. 39. 39. I said 30. Yeah. Okay. 39. But it was all very close. You were close. We are bilingual. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't go that far. (laughs) But anyways, welcome back, everyone. We've got a good show today. I mean, we've got, I think we always have good shows. Some are definitely better than others, but this one, right at the top. Yeah, we got a full episode. We do. And not only that, I mean, we've got a really good guest that we're going to talk about, but we've got a voicemail. We do have a voicemail. (laughs) It always just makes me so excited. I know. Every time, whenever I get the notification that we get a voicemail, I send it straight to mom. (laughs) (laughs) And I listen, and it just makes me happy. It makes my heart happy. Yes. And we've got lots of tweets, too. So many tweets. I think, like, people just kind of really took the idea of sisters who competed in NCAA gymnastics and ran with it. Right. Which I had no idea people would be, like, so excited about it. But I guess, like... We're all seen as a puzzle because we know there have been sisters who competed in NCAA gymnastics, but it's not really a stat that people focus on, focus on and stick with. No, I think you only know about it when you hear like Kathy Johnson Clark will say, and she's got a sister who's, you know, that's really the only time you know. Right. At least for me, I just had no idea. But I still think when we do the summer series, we've got to do that. Oh, totally. We have it on our list. Speaking of, Kent, who kind of started the madness, he did. if you will. He did. <laughs> so thank you, Kent. He tweeted and said, I love listening to you guys. And this was so much fun to try and remember the various sisters I enjoyed watching or heard over the years. So thank you, Kent. And as I mentioned last episode, at NCAA Gym Stats actually started a Google Doc. And so I know a lot of people have been tweeting us about sisters that they're remembering. So thank you for that. I'm going to try and keep the Google Doc updated with what you guys are sending me. But if you all want to add to the Google Doc, I'll link it on our website so that everyone can just have access to the Google Doc. I know. And to me, I've got this smile on my face because this is what gymnastics conversations is all about, right? That There's this community that we're all sharing information and talking about things that get us excited. And so now that there's going to be a Google Doc that the whole country can share. (laughs) The whole world. The whole world can share with sisters on it. I think it's pretty cool. And it's not just sisters that they listed. Like they go into other relationships like sister, brother, like the whole family, the whole family relationships. Like we have it recorded in the Google Doc. So so. there's brothers in there too? Yeah. There's a lot of brother, sister. How about parent? Son, brother. Mother, wife. (laughs) (laughs) You know what would be interesting, again, not that I'm encouraging another Google Doc by any shape or form, but would also be interesting our coach daughter. In college gymnastics? Uh Uh-huh. That would probably be pretty tough. You think? Yeah. Let us know if that is a thing. That could just be neat, just kind of understanding all the connections. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That that might be a little broad, though, huh? (laughs) That might just get out of control. (laughs) We'll see. People may like really enjoy doing that. So we're not going to stop you. <laughs> so do you want to read the next tweet? Sure. So the next tweet came from AB Jim. And uh, AB Jim says, I love how much love Alicia Boren gets on your podcast. So deserved. Yes, very true. Very true. And then we also got a tweet from Jim Khan, and they say, catching up on the routine podcast before season, smiley face. Big smiley face. And I think that's pretty common. I think a lot of people are kind of holding out and binge listening, if you will, to our podcast. So 
Hello, everybody. <laughs> That's back with us. Yeah, no, I think everybody kind of took a hiatus, including us. And now it's everybody's back. Mm-hmm. And uh, I love it because it's like family. You know, the family's back. Everybody's back. We're back on. Um, people are listening again. And it's just, for me, it just feels more exciting this year than last. Really? It is. I think it's the amount of engagement that we're getting with the tweets and the voicemails and the interviews that we're scheduling. I just think it's it feels different for me this year. It feels real. It does. It's not like we're just kind of winging it. Well, not only that, <laughs> but that's very true. But it's also, I think last year, I always felt that we could always stop if we needed to. <laughs> oh. Yeah, now we're we're in it to win it now. Right, right. And even like, oh, okay, when Nationals is, is over, then maybe we're over. We'll reevaluate. Yeah, and then Summer Series is over. Let's just kind of take our time, right? But now I feel like we're in it to win it. We're like steamrolling. <laughs> <laughs> Move out of our way. <laughs> exactly. We also got a voicemail. Yay, to the voicemail. Yes. So let's take a listen. Happy holidays, uh, Chelsea and Diana. This is Erky, one of your listeners, UCLA graduate and season ticket holder. I'm a little late on your freshman episode, but I just wanted to chime in. Really looking forward to seeing uh, Nora Flatley from UCLA. I was watching Meet the Bruins, and one thing I noticed is that her hands are incredible. When she's on beam, you know, the way her fingers are pointed, it's like she's earning points just by the way she holds her hands. Another thing I, I noticed about her is, she kind of has this look, uh, kind of reminds me of uh, another UCLA gymnast, Elise hopner Uh She was a Canadian Olympian. She had this kind of stare that was awesome. It was kind of part of her routine. Anyway, um, love the show. Looking forward to listening in 2019. And hopefully I'll see you at a UCLA meet, your 2018 national champions. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Love the ending. <laughs> yes. I think that's probably like how he ends all his emails, telephone calls. Uh, by the way, the uh, 2018 national champions. <laughs> Let me just slide that in there <laughs> in case you forgot. <laughs> Love the voicemail, Erky. Thank you so much for sending it to us. Yes, that was so great. Um, agree about Nora, right? So agree. But do you know who Elise Hoffner Hibbs is? I don't. I, I remember watching Nora and I agree with him with how she puts her fingers in her hands. Totally agree. She points her fingers. I know. <laughs> That's uh-huh. such a good way to put it. It is. But actually, you bringing up Elise Hoffner Hibbs like takes me way back. Like that's around the time that I like kind of really got interested in college gymnastics because way back when one of my first real college gymnastics meets that I went to was at UCLA. I think that was around Elise Hoffner Hibbs time. And like, I was just in awe. Really? He's so right in saying that she just had to look at you and like, she captivated you. Really? Yes. Oh, I have to, you have to maybe send me a link to YouTube. I'd love to see her compete. Yeah. I'll probably link one of my favorite floor teens. She was a really beautiful dancer and she had the big skills to go along with it. Wow. So I definitely can see the connection that you made with Nora Flatley and Elise Hoffner Hibbs. Yeah. I look forward to watching Nora. I really do. Yeah. I think she she has a great career ahead of her mm-hmm. and I'm excited to see what she does with college gymnastics. And the Bruins. And the Bruins, yes. Speaking of the twenty eighteen <laughs> national champions. We have an interview today. We do. Do you want to? Sure. I'll start. So as you all know, we really strive to bring you interviews and stories that you would find interesting. We know that Miss Val has a new book out called Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. And we had the chance to read some of it and thought, wouldn't it be great if Miss Val was on our show. So um, today, you get the chance to hear her. She uh, talked with us, I guess it was a couple weeks ago that we had the chance to sit down and talk. And wow, what a great interview. So great. She includes a lot of tidbits and a lot of personal stories about her book, about her career at UCLA, how it felt winning the national championship, and a little preview of what we can expect for this coming season. Sure. And, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to her is, of course, she's retiring this year. 
And we wanted to make sure that we got the chance to talk to her about the decision to retire and about, as you said, the championship. And did they somehow go together? Uh, And so she shared that with us. Yes. And for those of you who are not familiar with Valerie Condos Field, she is the head coach of the UCLA gymnastics team. She is entering her 29th year as the head coach and the 37th year on the coaching staff. She began her career at UCLA as the assistant coach and choreographer in 1983 and was promoted to head coach in 1991. And in 1997, she led the Bruins to the first ever national championship title. And since then, they have won six more team titles, including the most recent, as we know, in 2018. So we're so excited. We are joined by Miss Val, the coach of UCLA. Hi, Miss Val. Hi, Chelsea, Diana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. We've got so much to cover. I think we've got to start, though, with the win last year. We were there, by the way. Yes. <laughs> you know what? Do you agree that it was one of, if not the greatest, comeback in sports history? Absolutely. And not only that, it sh- was one of the most exciting moments to watch in sports history. Mm-hmm. It really was. And, you know, I do a lot of speaking, especially with younger athletes. And I always tell them, I want you to go back and watch the YouTube of the last event. Because regardless of what people think, we did not know we had a chance. It's so important to see our team's reaction when Pang finishes her routine. (laughs) Because there was so much excitement. But that was simply because we could leave without any regrets. It wasn't because we thought we won. Yeah, it was amazing. And so where we were at in the arena is we were very close to being. Mm -hmm. Uh So we were very close to watching where you all were, right? So we could see the girls. We could see you. Mm -hmm. We could see Oklahoma. (laughs) (laughs) And they talk about, you know, how the energy in the room was palpable. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. I know. I can't wait till they make a movie about it. (laughs) so serious about that because it's just like Miracle on Ice. It's got that drama that you don't even have to make up. And when I've talked with some producers about this, they say there is more facts in here than we would ever even dream to make up to put in a script. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) It's absolutely true. And can I ask when you went home that night, how long did the high continue for you? It honestly continued for a few weeks because I would wake up every morning and I'd say, how the heck did that happen? (laughs) And then throughout the day, you know, everybody congratulates you, which is really fun when you win. And, and people would want you to recap the the last few moments. And and every time I did, I would be thinking, how did it happen? How'd that happen? (laughs) Well, and I have to share, you know, Chelsea's always been a UCLA fan. And she's, every year, she's pulling for you guys, absolutely every year. Mm -hmm. And I was beside her, obviously, in the stadium when you guys won. And she literally started crying. (laughs) Oh, Chelsea, thank you. As did I. (laughs) It was just such an amazing moment, especially, like you said, nobody was really expecting it. And then Pang nailed an absolutely beautiful beam set. And it was just incredible to see it all come together. I wish we had video of me when the girls are pointing up to the scoreboard when the leaderboard changes and we've realized we've won and they're going crazy. (laughs) And I wish there was a camera on me because I was waving my hands back and forth in front of my face. I wasn't screaming, but I was saying really loudly, no, 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 don't get excited, don't get excited, this is like the Academy Awards with the open the wrong envelope, no, 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 don't get excited, don't get excited, there's no way we could have done that, and as I'm saying that, I turn my head to the left, and I see the TV cameras running towards us, and then the woman that's carrying that big, heavy championship trophy is trying to keep up with them, and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute, they think we won too. <laughs> must have won. (laughs) It was so 
hard for me to believe. And it's, you know, I said in the telecast right before we went to BIM, I said, I have no affinity for math. So in my mind, we can still win this thing, which was a joke because we were in fourth the entire meet. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were in fourth place till Pang went. Yeah. I think the other thing that we'd share with you is that, you know, we were obviously working on the podcast at that point and, you know, trying to get interviews and we had not talked to someone from UCLA. And so, you know, we ran to that side of the arena where the fans were and we happened to run into a UCLA fan and we started talking about, you all just won, how do you feel? And this beautiful woman began talking about how excited she was and, you know, how wonderful Christine had worked to make it to this point. And then I said in your name and she's like, I'm Pang's mom. <laughs> I was going to say, there's only one person that calls her Christine, and that's her mom. <laughs> As a mother of a gymnast, and you've watched them work, you know, all of these years at this sport that they love, for them to have their moment just does your heart good. You know, it really does. And I'm a huge sports fan. I love football. Peyton Manning's one of my all-time favorites. And He's going to go down as one of the most illustrious quarterbacks in the, in the history of the game. And he had one of his worst games, his last game. And for an athlete to be able to finish how Pang did, getting perfect tens on both the events that she competes on, after she's been through so much injury and recovery and rehab, for her to be able to finish like that is every athlete's dream to go out on that kind of a high. Absolutely. You know, we love reliving the magic, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. As do I. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your decision to retire. I started thinking about it four years ago when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I knew from what my doctors had told me that if I chose to get chemotherapy, that the, they were certain the chemo would, would work. And so I knew I wasn't going to die of that breast cancer. But something I think hits people when you get in a situation like that. And it just hit me that we all have an expiration date. I just don't know when mine is. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And there are so many things that I've been interested my entire life in doing. I love choreographing and directing live shows. And I've been in the works of an urban nutcracker for many years. And there's all these things that I've wanted to do, including making sure this university gets a course on John Wooden implemented. And I want to do it when I have the energy and the youth and the health to be able to enjoy it and do it with vim and vigor. So at that point, I started thinking, I don't need to win another championship. I don't need any more celebrity. I don't need to be the head coach of the UCLA gymnastics team for any more fulfillment than I already have. You know, winning is really fun. Going out and speaking on behalf of the university as the sitting head coach is really fun. But I knew I was ready. And that was two years ago. My contract was up. I told my athletic director, I said, I'm not going to sign another three-year contract. I'll be done after next year. And they were asking me what it would take for me to stay for five. And I said, I don't think it would be good for the program. I really don't. It was really perfect timing for me being able to just check off the years and make sure that I left no stone unturned and left without any regrets. And I do know that the biggest change for me is going to be not having the daily interaction with the student athletes. They're all I've ever known. And I don't have children of my own. So for 36 years, I've been at UCLA. And we start training at 745 every morning. By 750, I've had 20 of the most amazing hugs and good morning Miss Val <laughs> that anybody could ever ask for. That's not normal. That's the only thing I'm, I'm sad about is that I know that that will be a major transition for me. Yeah. Well, I'm sure if you just came back on campus, you could still get those hugs though. I could get the hugs. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I have Bruin fans saying, well, you, you at least have to stay in choreograph. And every time someone says that, I was just asked that at a speaking gig I did last week. And I said, okay, I'm going to ask every one of you in the room, how many of you think it's a good idea for a legendary coach of a legendary program to stick around and be even visible with a new regime? How many of you think that's a good idea? And nobody could raise their hand. Right. Wow. I said, it's just not fair to the new person that takes over. And as weird as this sounds, I do believe 
UCLA Gymnastics, it's time for new blood and new leadership. And I know it sounds crazy because we're just coming off of a championship and we're packing Poly Pavilion and yay, yay, yay. But I do. Sure. Uh Well, and that uh, really kind of transitions to your book, because a lot of what you're saying now is what you've said in your book in terms of really kind of understanding who you are and what you need in your life. Mm -hmm. And so can we talk a little bit about life is too short? Don't wait to dance. Yeah, thank (laughs) you. It's doing great. (laughs) Thank you. All of you have brought it. Thank you for all who just made this last surge for the holidays. I had so many people saying, just got it for my family for their holidays. It's the only present my mom wanted was your book. I was like, great. It's a really good book. Thank you. And so let's talk about when you decided to write the book. When I was in chemotherapy, because... I had already been doing a lot of speaking engagements, and every time I spoke, people would say, where can I buy your book? And I'd say, I don't have a book. They would ask why. And I'm a voracious reader, and I've always understood that anything that is truthful has already been said. There's no new wisdom out there. And one of my girlfriends, Abby Shapiro, said, but we all need people in our generation to put it in our words so that it's relatable to what we're going through. That's why you need to write the book. And she said, and make sure you write it in your voice. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation that you're having with Miss Val. Mm -hmm. The book starts off with me watching 60 Minutes when the Larry Nassar horribleness broke and the three athletes that were on 60 Minutes, two of them, Jeanette Antolin and Jamie Dancher, had been our athletes. And I was just stunned. By that point, I had been, I think I'd been writing the book for about six months. I remember calling my publisher and telling her the story about listening to that. She goes, that's how you have to open the book. And I said, well, doesn't that sound rather opportunistic? She goes, no, it doesn't matter. It's the truth. And it was interesting because when I talked to Jamie Dancher about why it took her until she was in her 30s to realize what had happened to her. And she said, Miss Val... Because I found my voice when I was at UCLA Gymnastics through the program. She says, and it took me that long to be able to really listen to my voice and to my history and my path and trust that I was being honest and truthful with everything. She said, had I not had that experience, I don't know if I would have come to this conclusion even now. And so one of the things that I'm so adamant about with our student athletes is making sure that they not only learn how to use their voices, but learn how to really listen to their inner voices and then how to be able to use them in a respectful and honest way. And for her to say that to me, that was the perfect way to open the book. Sure. I feel that coaches in the last five, six, seven decades have always felt that there has to be such strict disciplinary relationship between the coach and the athletes. And because of that, the joy is taken out of learning. And I've never understood why coaches feel that you're going to get a better result from your athletes when you take the joy out of the process. That has never resonated with me. That was a big part of why I wanted to write the book was to prove that you can teach from a place of compassion and tough love and discipline, but the joy can still remain. Joy should never be taken out of learning anything, whether it's sports or math or how to cook or whatever. It shouldn't. You're going to get a much better product if you bring enthusiasm and joy along in the process. Totally agree. When we watch your Bruins before a meet, during a meet, dancing to the music, having a good time, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you can see the joy there. You know, you'll like this story. Two years ago, we finished fourth in the country. And afterwards, I had a coach (laughs) who was on the Super 6 floor come up to me and say, you know, I really think you guys would do a lot better if you weren't having so much fun. (laughs) And I've always enjoyed constructive criticism because I feel like it's an opportunity to learn and maybe change how I do things. And so I said, wow, okay, who do you think has the most fun? Inarguably, it's Pang. And he goes, 
Yeah. And I said, she just got a 10 <laughs> on balance beam at the national championships. Okay. So she doesn't count. Okay. Who's next? Caitlin. Okay. Caitlin. Caitlin just PR'd and we went through the whole team and there were two athletes on our team that had a horrible championship. And those were the two that did not have fun. They didn't bring fun to the championship floor. So I said, thank you so much for the observation. I'll do me and, you know, and so then this last year after we won, he came up and he goes, okay, I'm a jackass. I don't know what I'm talking about. Congratulations. I bet that felt nice to hear. I said, I appreciate that. I have lots of notes on the book. Okay. I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, but if you could just give a teaser for those who haven't read it, and I'm just going to say a couple of words, and if then you can just say kind of what you meant by that so that people get a sense. Okay. Hitting the refresh button. Oh, that's super important in life is to hit your proverbial refresh button on everything, on everything that you want to be, on kindness, on gratitude, especially gratitude. If we could all learn to hit the refresh button on gratitude every time you think of it, your life literally opens up into living color. And you can't be a victim when you are enumerating your gratitudes. So that refresh button is something I thought about many, 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 many years ago when I was coaching Beam because I would see that they would make a mistake and they would just get stuck in this negativity. And I would say, you know, in a, on a computer, when you hit the refresh button, it gets rid of all the, the junk. And that's what you need to do in your mind. You hit the refresh button and it'll get rid of the noise so that you can focus on the process. Absolutely. So the next one, which I, re- I mean, I relate to all of them, but this one, especially in my life, the desert. Mm. Yeah, that chapter came out of a musing that I did on my website. And I'm still getting people telling me how much that resonated with them. Because we all go through the desert. Mm-hmm. All of us. There's not a human being that has lived on this earth that has not gone through the desert multiple times. Hopefully you live long enough to go through the desert multiple times. And most people think that life is only worth living when it's the good part, when it's the good times, the easy times. And I think a lot of people don't realize and appreciate how enriching the bad times are. That's when you can see who you really are and be proud of that. That's when you become a better version of yourself is when you're challenged in the desert. And I'm sure that we all know people in our lives that they live a life of just walking in circles in the desert. They never take that first step to step outside to start walking out of the desert. The last one, embracing the suck. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that one. And I love the analogy, you know, what Coach wouldn't, but talk about that one. Right. That came from my co-author. I was talking one day, just got to playing golf. I said, how was it? He said, "Um, well, I loved it. I had a great time and I suck at golf. And I said, well, then how did you have a good time? And he said, because I don't have time to work on my game. I don't have time to take classes or lessons. I don't even have time to go out and practice putting or driving. But I love being outside. I love playing the game. I love being with my friends. He said, so I can either embrace the suck (laughs) until I do have time to get better or not play. And I realized when he said that, that's what I did for so many years when I wouldn't go take a dance class because I was no longer technically the dancer that I had been when I was dancing professionally. And it sucked. (laughs) I remember going and taking a ballet class and within the first few minutes, my legs were shaking and I left the class. I thought well, this doesn't make any sense because I love to dance. All of us have that spirit of dance in us. I love to dance. Who cares if I suck? Nobody's looking at you in class, Valerie. Get over yourself. <laughs> so I went back to class and I did have to give my disclaimer to the, to the teacher. And I just said, listen, I have not done this in a lot of time. So I'm going to stay in the back and you don't have to worry about correcting me or giving me any attention. <laughs> I'm just going to enjoy moving to music. And she said, great. If you go back and watch video of me coaching, that's when I went from coaching and posturing that I was a coach because I didn't feel like I'd allow myself to dance 
on the competition floor because that wasn't, people would think I wasn't taking it seriously. And that's when I said, okay, this is nonsense. I'm just going to do me. And if the spirit moves me, I'm going to dance. <laughs> Which therein lies the title of the book. <laughs> therein lies the title of the book. Life is short. Don't wait to do anything that makes your heart sing. Nothing. Absolutely. Well, again, I love the book. Absolutely love it. It is, I highly, highly recommend it. We've loved talking to you. I think Chelsea wants to ask you about the team this year. Yes. <laughs> yes. A couple of weeks ago, Meet the Bruins was fantastic. We got a little bit of a taste of what we can expect this year. And you've been a part of so many fantastic teams in your career. But what about this team makes it different from other teams you've coached? This team is... And I think you saw it, especially on floor, and they're like little spitfires, <laughs> which is obviously really, really fun to work with. I really don't know if it's because it's my last year, or I don't know if it's because the types of personalities we have on the team, but our floor routines this year are on a whole other level. And I think it's because that has become our norm, our normal there's nobody in the gym that doesn't dance and perform hard every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's just become our culture. They're really, really fun. It's fun to see people like Kyla Ross that are starting to own her movement quality and her maturity. You know, she's playing with the movements and she's being a little exotic and a little flirty and in a really authentic way, not because Miss Val told me to do this choreography. And I think what's great about that is that because everyone is so great on floor, it pushes everyone on the team to be better. It really does. Right now we've got eight that we're gonna have to decide who's competing. Eight great routines, great tumbling, great performers. And I keep turning to Joe. And I'm like, all right, Joe, what's it going to be? She's like, you're the head coach. I said, well, you're the floor coach. What's it going to be? I know Caitlin Ohashi during Meet the Bruins, she didn't have her new floor routine yet. Is there anything you can tease us with? <laughs> yeah. She didn't have it because we really struggled with music. And we thought, let's do a whole Prince thing. Let's Ooh. do Tina Turner. Let's do, you know, all of these different angles. And a lot of what we came up with, that she came up with, it was really cool, but it wasn't joyful. Mm. And I said, Caitlin, your last routine, even if people didn't like the routine, they couldn't help but smile right. watching you do it. We, we can't lose that part of it. That fun, joyful playfulness. We ended up with a medley. There is a lot of still Michael Jackson in it. And I don't usually like music that has a lot of different edits, but I asked Ariana Berlin to edit it. And she and, and myself and Caitlin and a few other people went over to Ari's house one night and spent a few hours just throwing everything at the computer that we could think of. And came up with something that is really fun. I wanted there to be more choreography dance in it than last year because, you know, can't do same old, same old. Mm -hmm. right. It's like last year's routine, only there's more playfulness to it. There's more enticing the audience with all of the different edits of the different songs that have come in. So uh, it's going to be great, <laughs> basically. <laughs> it's going to be really great. You saw our first pass, right? Yes. Split double out incredible <laughs> incredible and then she informed me that she's going to go back to her freshman middle pass which is adding an extra flip in there i was like okay why you don't need it she goes why not said, okay <laughs> it's her senior year she go big <laughs> okay then i don't know if you saw it it was on her instagram story so she goes home for the holidays and we had about oh my gosh we had maybe 80 percent of the routine done and i get this brainstorm choreographically so I was in my kitchen getting ready for a dinner party. I call her. We FaceTime each other. She's in her bedroom. I said, Kate, okay, put your music on. And I'm choreographing her routine over FaceTime. But I had my phone popped up literally between a loaf of French bread and an onion. So that I could be hands off. And 
I wanted her to do this intricate foot pattern. And I'm like, no, Kate, start on your left foot, not your right start. Start your left. And so she takes her phone and she puts it down on her little feet. And she goes, is this right? I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not right. And then I said, this would be hysterical if you had been recording this. And I didn't know that she had and that she posted it. <laughs> so I think that's just apropos, you know, with her and my relationship, that that's how I choreographed her last routine. Thank you. Oh, well, we can't wait to see it. We yes. can't wait to see it. And, you know, we're in Maryland, obviously you're in California, but we're going to make a trip to Oklahoma. Oh, great. So we'll get to see the routine in person. person. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to meet you and let's keep in touch and we can meet in Oklahoma. I would love it. And this has been an absolute absolutely wonderful interview. Yes. We Thank love you. talking to you and again love the book and just love everything that you've done and contributed to the sport. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been an absolute privilege. I couldn't have imagined this life that I've led and this career I've had and I'm just so 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 blessed. So thank you. Thank you again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Best of luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. talk with Miss Val for another half hour, an right. hour, right? No. Um, but we didn't want to monopolize her time. But highly, highly encourage you to read her book. Um, you can purchase it anywhere books are sold, but specifically you can go to the official MissVal.com website and order the book there. It's a quick read, mm -hmm. easy read, quick read, but there are things in the book that will stay with you. And will really kind of guide you in your life about how you deal with things, look at things. But just taking control of your life is really how I would say it. Yeah, what I really enjoyed about the book is that it's not just for the gymnastics community. It's not just for coaches. Really anyone can take important life skills from reading the book. So again, like mom said, you can head to her website official missval.com to purchase your book and fun fact you all can actually watch ucla tomorrow at 9 p.m eastern standard time on espn2 for their meet against nebraska it's been a good show chelsea it has i don't know if we're going to be able to top the miss val interview in the future <laughs> know, right but season starts tomorrow Yay! it's what we've all been waiting for so as mom mentioned a couple episodes ago she is certain that we all need to decide mm -hmm. who we think is going to win nationals this year. I do. I think so. I really do. And you have said from the very beginning, we need to do it before season starts. Right. So Because you got to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. We're doing a Twitter poll. It kind of got complicated for us and to figure out how to do this. But I think, I mean, if it doesn't work, you guys will let us know. But we put order of who we thought was going to win for you to choose from. And we did different combinations. Mm -hmm. And if there's not a combination that you think is going to happen, you can comment a different combination below. So for instance, we did like UCLA, Oklahoma, LSU. That was one combination. Of course, we did Oklahoma, UCLA, Florida, Florida, number two, or Florida, Oklahoma, UCLA, right? So we put these combinations out. We're going to vote ourselves because... <laughs> I don't know if we believe in any of the combinations I just said. <laughs> but again, if the combination doesn't exist that you think is going to happen, you can fill out the comment. Yes. And that's the best way we thought we could do it. If yeah. it doesn't work again, let us know. But for me, it's just getting what people think is really going to happen by April. Yes. And we'll be sharing our predictions on next week's show. Maybe the first one who responds to the poll gets a routine podcast back. Ooh. Wouldn't that be good? The first one that responds correctly. But we won't know correctly until the end of the year. Yeah, that's the point. Well, I don't think we want to wait three months to give somebody a bag. But you don't get a bag <laughs> just for comments. I think you should. Participation award. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just because you participated first, you get a bag. 
Uh, don't count on it, guys. <laughs> I think so. I'll send you one myself. <laughs> and so we won't say who we choose until next week, but we'll also reveal what everybody else has chosen as well. Yeah, we'll reveal the top answers. That'd be great. That'd yes. be fun. And thank you again for all of your comments and all of your research that you all are sharing with us. The um, research especially. Yeah. The Google Doc. Yeah, so cool. It really is. So thank you, NCAA Gym Stats. Thank you, Kenty Mack, for getting this whole thing started. We definitely will do a sister's episode. Like I said, it'd probably be during the summer series when we can dedicate the time that it deserves. Yes. And I hope you all enjoy the first weekend of season. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. And may the odds be forever in your favor. (laughs) (laughs) We're not doing Hunger Games. You just hear a cannon shot. (laughs) Right, we're not doing Hunger Games. (laughs) And we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye.